Um, I thought I would begin by going way back to this week in 1838. In 1838, Henry S. Grant, who was the publisher of the Western Herald and Farmer's Almanac, based in Sandwich, Ontario, which later, of course, became Windsor, let his frustrations be known. And if any of you are involved in PR, I don't necessarily endorse this approach, but it is interesting. Henry wrote, we have toiled unceasingly ever since we had the misfortune to cast our lot among a community of idlers in blank. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, that we have printed and published the Western Herald and Farmer's Magazine 33 weeks for barely 150 subscribers. Can it be supposed that we can or will be full enough to waste our time, health, comfort, peace of mind, and bodily labor for another year in the matter we have done and for so contemptible a number of subscribers. <laughs> never, never. And this is why the former publisher, Henry Grant, is my hero. But Henry did keep publishing, and we can understand his frustration because he had tried to shape his relationship with his user community. And in the second month of his pub first year of publication, he printed something called the Printer's Ten Commandments, and I'm only going to read two of them, but they're brilliant if you've ever been involved with publishing. Number three, thou shalt not perpetuate manic prose nor insane rhyme, and expect thy vile effusions to be published as the outpourings of youthful genius. <laughs> and my favorite is number five, thou shalt not borrow thy neighbor's newspaper, but go to him that hath to sell and buy for thyself. <laughs> Way to go, Henry. Uh, and Henry's words probably fit better today, 174 years later, than they did back then. Um, we all know newspapers are in trouble. Um, mostly what I'm going to focus on with newspapers is the amount of text they're responsible for. And that's an incredible amount. Newspapers are responsible for more text than even books. But if you're interested in the state of the newspaper industry, there's a wonderful blog called Newspaper Death Watch, which is a very thoughtful kind of uh, uh, monitoring of what's going on with newspapers, despite its title, and I, I would highly recommend it. And I think, just one final thing on this, it's very interesting to me that newspapers are still responsible for a lot of news, so if we lose newspapers, someone has to think a lot about where we're going to get a lot of news from. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about removing barriers to discovery. So Henry Grant's words, like many other publishers from his era, are buried in one of the most horrific formats that libraries have ever unleashed on their patrons, and that is microfilm. And I don't think I have to explain the deficiencies of microfilm very much to this particular crowd. I think you all understand it quite well. But I got four examples here of some of the things you deal with if you're dealing with microfilm content. So my paper, the one at the very back, has missing pieces. Very common with old scan newspapers where pieces of the pages are actually not there anymore. The Provincial Freeman, which is one of two abolitionist newspapers from our area, is sort of what I call sort of a half and half newspaper pa uh, newspaper's uh, image where half of it's readable, half of it is not. The marine record, which is that long one, is a case which is very common in microfilm where a bunch of pages are stuffed together in one picture. So there are eight, page, eight pages on one image. Many of the uh, pictures on that reel have 16 pages on one image, and that turns out to be a real pain to deal with. It's a pain in microfilm. It's a pain if you uh, scan the microfilm. And of course, at the front, it's the, uh, something called the Amherstburg District Advertiser, which is just completely unreadable. And that is also common with microfilm. Many microfilm sources, especially for things like community newspapers, things that are not the Globe and Mail or the Montreal Gazette, they don't tend to get it microfilmed as well as other sources. And you end up having to deal with that. Um, I'm not going to talk about the scanning process with microfilm, except to say it can be done quite cheaply. Um, but the enabling technology is really optical character recognition, or OCR. And OCR goes back a ways as well. The first patent was awarded in 1929. And I, I don't know how many people here follow the Maker blog, but this is the kind of diagram that would fit well there. The first OCR device was actually a physical device. It had templates, and it used a photoelectric cell to try to match patterns on the page to patterns that were on the template. 
And OCR software more or less works the same way even now, but it started out as a physical device, which I think is really cool. And it sort of went mainstream in the 50s when people started buying OCR systems. And I'm going to jump straight to the chase about in comparing the commercial and open source options for OCR. Abby is uh, probably the leading OCR package in the commercial world. There's probably much more debate about that on the commercial side than there is on the OCR side about which is the best. But if you're dealing with large volumes, chances are, you are you've looked at Abby or you're evaluating it at some level. Uh, Abby has good language support. It supports an eight, 189 plus languages. It has sophisticated user interface tools. Um, it's also sold through resellers, and that's significant um, because it makes it very hard to say how much it actually costs. It depends a bit on your reseller, uh, but there are volume licensing options available. What's neat about Abby is it has this sort of grid processing option. So if you're dealing with a lot of pages, like thousands or millions, you tend to need something like this to handle the volume. And Abby has some options about that, which has some limits, which I'll talk about. Abby can produce coordinates for each character of OCR text, and that becomes really important for things like highlighting text. Um, so that's really useful. And it's a, it's a very mature OCR, applica OCR application. I'm an open source type of person. I believe in open source very strongly, but I do recognize Abby is good at what it does, and it's certainly helped a lot of projects get running. In the open source corner, we have Tesseract. Uh, there are other open source OCR packages, but I don't think there's a lot of debate that Tesseract's one of the best ones right now. Tesseract doesn't have as many languages, but you can add your own language, which is kind of cool. What I think is really neat about Tesseract, and it doesn't seem to get highlighted very often, is you can add your own symbols with an existing language. So if you were doing something like you were looking for music, musical notation symbols or something like that in scanned text, Tesseract would be good at that. Now, Tesseract doesn't have a graphical user interface on its own. It does have a command line interface. And I suspect for this crowd, that's probably the ultimate user interface. So it does have that. And it started out as proprietary software. It was released as open source in 2005. And Google uh, has sponsored development since then. I've always been kind of vague on how much Google adds to the project. So Google claims to use Tesseract at some level for a lot of their OCR, but it's never really clear how much of that engineering goes into Tesseract proper. Uh, but the system, I think, is quite strong. So microfilm scan content, that's largely what I've dealt with. And it's not the greatest source for OCR, even with a top-of-the-line commercial option. So this is a particularly bad example. This is from the Provincial Freeman. And you'll see the accuracy rate is not that high, even with a top-of-the-line commercial package. So Abby gets about half the words there, and Tesseract gets about a quarter of the words that are in that image. Now, that sounds really bad, but again, I'm looking at papers I'm trying to get off microfilm. The bar is not high for information access for this type of material. And this will, we're happy to get even 50% on some of our poorer scans. Um, so the trick with using Tesseract, the trick with making open source OCR software work for your project is image pre-processing. Abby bundles that in. Abby's got very sophisticated logic for taking images and creating an optimum form of that image for OCR. If you're going to use an open source approach and you have compromised objects, things from microfilm, you have to pre-process them somehow. And this is one of the tricks that we've used a lot with microfilm. We call it running the dogs, but it's running difference of Gaussians twice and difference of Gaussians to image technique. But basically the idea is you bold everything and then you fade it out again. Now, it doesn't get rid of lines so well, but it's very good for getting rid of dots. And if you're dealing with uh, OCR off microfilm, you tend to have a lot of dots on the image. So this is the kind of thing you end up doing. So what we would do with an image like the one I showed you previously is we would take the one on the left and try to make it look something like the one on the right. And when we do that, Tesseract pretty much catches Abby for OCR accuracy. It's still not great for many of these sources, but it's comparable, and um, it's, it makes it quite flexible as well. The interesting thing is it doesn't work if we go the other way. So if I take the image on the right, and I give it to Abby, I still get the same number, the same accuracy rate. So whatever Abby does for its pre-processing, it's quite different. 
Um, the coordinates thing's important because we like to highlight things on images. Uh, we go to a lot of trouble to actually not expose to a lot of OCR until you burrow into a paper. So our, like even our results site sets, we show the image with the highlighted terms. And this is really useful if your OCR is not that great. It means it still looks reasonable. Because if you've looked at OCR up closely for any of the major newspaper projects, it tends to look like gobbledygook. And that's fine if you're down to the point where you want to correct that or you're down at the article level. But for searching, we tend to defer to the images. Uh, the other source I've dealt with, uh, I was fascinated Indonesia already came up once this morning, but uh, the other set that I've worked with quite recently is uh, from something called the Violent Conflict in Indonesia Study. And what they have done here is the World Bank Conflict and Development Team has sent out volunteers with digital cameras, and they take pictures of newspaper pages to measure violence in Indonesia, and they've collected a huge a set of papers as a result of this. So the set I'm working on right now is about eight terabytes of image data, and it's about one million pages. And they estimate they have something like three to four million pages. It's a fascinating project, and there's a very good video on YouTube about this particular project, but um, I won't get into um, it ex itself. Uh, I, these are the two tools I've tended to work a lot with. I think many people here know them quite well. They're very solid. Uh, they help us a lot in trying to do batch image processing. Um, and this is how we've tended to use them. So we tend to use image magic a, a lot for things like rotating images. So the Indonesian project, they've taken many of their pictures and put the paper sideways to get the full page into one uh, camera shot. So we use image magic to rotate them in batch, and that works really well. For the cleanup of the image, we tend to use the GIMP more. And I, I don't know exactly why, but something like difference of Gaussians is much more efficient in the GIMP, and I'm not sure why that is. But basically the trick is we try to find a recipe for an image set that works and then apply it to all the images we have. So this is sort of what it looks like if you get up close to the Indonesian set. And you can sort of see what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the letters bolder, and we're trying to fade out the background. If we can do that, the OCR has a better chance of matching characters. And it's a mixed bag. I mean, these are compromised objects from the beginning. The accuracy rate is not going to be terribly high. But more or less, uh, we can get a better uh, rate of accuracy from Tesseract with this approach. Um, so this is how we try to do most of our testing, is we'll take sample sets and we'll search common terms and we'll look at the results. And generally speaking, Abby almost always gets it right, but gets fewer results. With Tesseract, we tend to get more hits, but we have more false positives. But generally speaking, we're quite happy with Tesseract for this particular set. Um, the old newspapers have lines between columns, almost very common with old newspapers, and it still happens with modern newspapers as well. If you look at the Globe and Mail, for example, you'll notice there are lines between columns. You can leverage that for OCR, and we try to do that with the historical newspapers. Um, and I'm not going to get in very far into this, but basically the idea, <laughs> the idea is, is you look at the newspaper as a set of distinct blocks, you try to extract those blocks and do the OCR on them, and that tends to be more effective. Um, I'm a big fan of this thing called the line segment detector. It's very good at identifying lines, and that's how we've tended to uh, uh, do this kind of work with uh, older newspapers. And this is sort of what it looks like. Now, there can be, we can identify lines that aren't actually there, but for the most part, we get all the columns on a newspaper page, and that turns out to be a really good thing for OCR, because the columns often don't line up. They're characters that end up halfway through another character, and there can be different fonts for different columns. So breaking it up tends to lead to more effective OCR. Unfortunately, we can't always take that approach with modern newspapers, so, um, and many newspapers now use uh, blank columns, uh, blank lines between columns. Now, you would think you could do something very similar with this kind of, um, of situation, but we haven't quite cracked this one yet. It's fairly hard to, to identify these columns, because when you burrow down into the image, of course, they're not all white. There are specks here and there, so we're still looking at this. Uh, but one project I wanted to point out, I had a year to sort of work on OCR as part of a sabbatical, 
And I had seen the Olina project, but I hadn't looked closely at it until the very end. And I think if I had not gone through a lot of grief with OCR image manipulation, I would not have appreciated how strong it really is. Alina uses something called the Molina Image Library, and it's very good for pre-processing images. It's a project based in France, it's well-funded, it's very active, and it's sort of my new goal is to incorporate their really good plumbing into the kind of work we're doing with newspapers. So I just want to flag it. So OCR is not normally a fast nor efficient computer process. Open source, commercial, it really doesn't matter. OCR has a lot of overhead, uh, especially with newspapers, because newspaper pages have about eight times as much text as a book page. So our testing that we usually are at least 85 seconds for processing a page with OCR, and a single reel on a single machine can take a full day to run through. So, and that machine is busy doing OCR. It cannot do much else when it's uh, performing OCR. So it, it's got quite a heavy footprint. Uh, the approach we're taking with Tesseract for handling volume is using something called Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop sort of falls under the big data designation, and uh, you, you've already seen this uh, Gardner hype chart. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm that um, versed in what Hadoop does, we tend to use it as sort of a job scheduler. So Hadoop's an implementation of MapReduce, which Google's made famous for their indexing. Um, but we're using something called Hadoop Streaming. And any of you who follow Roy Tennant's blog, Roy's blogged about uh, streaming with Hadoop quite a bit. Streaming's a way to use other languages with Hadoop. Hadoop itself is a Java-based technology. We tend to do our work in Python. And one of the reasons for that is that Python has quite good image support, which is nice for the kind of things we're doing. It's a very fast way to uh, make changes. So. Um, Anyone who's versed in Hadoop would look at the map reduced tasks that are assigned to a job. So we actually only use the mapping part. We really use Hadoop as sort of a job scheduler. We pass out a bunch of OCR jobs to a bunch of machines. We get the results back, and then we process the results separately. You can process them at the same time with Hadoop, but for our kind of processing, there's not a huge advantage in doing so. Um, I tend to like virtual images for doing this kind of work. So what we've done at my library is we take uh, Ubuntu virtual image, we set up the OCR for, the, for using Hadoop, and then we put that virtual image on our Windows desktops. And the advantage of doing that is really that we can define everything once and push it out. And that the virtual machine seems to be quite stable. Um, uh, we could actually do it natively in Windows. We'd probably get a slight performance gain from doing so, but it just seems easier to manage. I like using lab machines much more than public machines. We try to target machines that are not busy and use them at night when the library's not open. But I really like a lab environment more. The, the only gut you with using a lab environment, is, of course, is, as all of you know who have labs in your library, this time of year they get very hard to book. So a lot of our processing has to be done late at night. And this is sort of what Hadoop looks like. Um, again, I'm not gonna claim great sophistication in Hadoop. We really use it as a job scheduler. But what's nice about it is we can sort of measure, the, see what's going on with what we process. And you can talk to individual machines that are doing the work. Um, the only thing that's a little tricky with Hadoop is it uses a lot of strange ports, and those of you with really good eyesight will see the ports that are used for individual machines. That's not a problem if you're on the same subnet and you're not blocking ports, but if you want to remap ports, Hadoop turns out to be quite a bit of a nightmare. Actually, and Abby does as well. They both use very odd ports and they both use lots of them. So um, the hope is you are in an environment uh, where you don't have to worry about that. I've done a little work looking at OCR in the cloud. Um, this is some times from some Amazon virtual images. And I must say, I really like Amazon's setup. Amazon makes it very easy to set up a sort of Hadoop environment online. Uh, but the response time has not been phenomenal with the Amazon images. And my suspicion is it's because the graphic support isn't as strong. I think when you're on a desktop, you know, there's a lot of plumbing put on desktops to handle things like games and moving pointers around. Whereas if you use something that's in a server environment, you know, the graphics tend to get short shift. 
but something like OCR, you actually need lots of graphics support. But anyway, I'm sort of fascinated by the idea of, you, of doing OCR in the cloud. The biggest gutcha, though, is not actually this. It's this. And I thought O'Reilly really captured one of the dilemmas with doing processing in the cloud really well. O'Reilly wrote, cloud-based big data services offer considerable advantages in removing the overhead of configuring and tuning your own clusters and in ensuring you pay only for what you use. The biggest issue is always going to be data locality, as it is slow and expensive to ship data. The most effective big data cloud solutions will be the ones where the data is also collected in the cloud. So the issue, at least with OCR in the cloud, is you've got to get the images there to get them processed in the first place. And that part tends to be expensive. The processing can be cheap in that environment, but the data can end up costing you. And that's why if you're at a library and you have lots of machines, you have a lot of network advantages for doing these kind of processing jobs. I, th I think there's sort of a fascinating area where libraries could be sort of an on-ramp for doing processing for different, pro different projects. Uh, this is the kind of thing we look for at the very end of the processing. Um, I'm really keen on coordinates, especially down to the character level, and the reason for that is this um, notion of box files. If any of you have ever done font training, you've probably dealt with box files. What box files are is they're basically every character on a page and what the coordinates of those characters are. And why that's useful is if, if you have someone who's doing OCR correction, or if you want to do corrections and feed it back into a recognition process, you have to keep the coordinates in sync. And that's very difficult to do unless you use something like box files. So there's a number of box file editors. And I think if we get into OCR correction, which we have not done yet, we'll do something like this. I'm really keen that we keep our coordinates in sync. Um, and at the bottom here, um, this is an example from Amazon. But because we produce text at the end of it all, this is why we don't do a big reduction phase in Hadoop. It's so efficient to process text. We can sort of just do all the work at the end after the OCR part is done. This is what coordinate information looks like in Abbey. And this is basically the amount of information you get for the word punch. And you'll see there's a lot of it. Abbey provides a lot of detail on things like confidence levels and whether it thinks the word is part of a letter. You can get all that from Tesseract. We have not pursued that because we do not use any of that information even with Abbey. Um, but you can burrow in that deeply. Again, with newspapers, it's tricky because the accuracy rates are not going to be that great if you're working from microfilm sources. So uh, a lot of these directions aren't necessarily going to lead you anywhere productive. So, um, so there, are, there are still lots of uses for Abby. I would say Abby works well if your image vary and there's no consistent approach to cleaning them. And that's very common with a lot of uh, uh, digital library projects. If there's not one thing you can do to all your images to make them better, then maybe you should consider Abby, because Abby has a much better chance of taking variable images and getting something useful from them. If you're in a Windows environment and you have some money to pay for OCR, Abby might be a good solution. If you're doing grid processing, Abby is a very Windows-centric solution. It has to run with a Windows server, it has to be on the same subnet, and it uses a dongle. It's a very sort of constrained that way. But for many places, that's okay. That's the kind of environment they have anyway. If you can do your OCR on one station, or you don't need to do a very full-fledged grid for the amount of content you have, Abby can work well. And if you're in a hurry, I mean, you can purchase Abby. It'll do a very good job out of the box. And that's certainly valid for many projects as well. I'd say with Tesseract, especially if you're scanning from analog, if you're taking the pages and they're going directly to the digital, I think you should look at Tesseract, because I think it's every bit as good as Abby in most cases. Um, and if you have a Unix environment, Tesseract works really well for that. Again, consistency is your friend. It doesn't really matter so much if the images are all bad. It's whether you can do the same thing on all those images to make them good again. That's the key. Otherwise, if you're working image by image, it, it gets very slow. If you have an OCR need to plug into a custom workflow, because uh, you have the source of Tesseract, um, you, can, you can do lots of things with it. And if you have very large quantities, I would look at Tesseract. I mean, hundreds of thousands or millions. You know, an Abbey grid beyond 30 stations gets very tricky to run. 
Tesseract with Hadoop, you can do thousands of machines if you actually have access to that many. The good thing is you can test all this out with committing to anything. Uh, you can get a trial version of Abby for either Windows or the Mac to do some testing, and you can do some testing online. So you can sort of get a sense of what's going to work best for you uh, right off the bat. Um, I wanted to mention with Tesseract, uh, Tesseract, you probably want to get at least version 3, and I would recommend getting the latest SVN version for testing it. It also has an HTML output. Again, a lot of really neat things about Tesseract are not documented terribly well. But the OCR version is very nice for looking at the results. Uh, Tesseract tries to do things like detect italics, detect bolding, and in the HTML version, it can convey all that on the screen. It also gives you coordinates to the word level in the uh, HTML output. So if you're doing something where you're highlighting words and you don't have to get coordinates down to the character level, you can do that straight out of the box with Tesseract once you have it running. Um, my stuff's available on GitHub. Again, I'm really focused on getting character coordinates. You may not need that for your project. Uh, it all depends really on how critical it is for you to keep coordinates in sync. Um, but if you're interested in that, I can certainly help with that. But it's all on GitHub. I also wanted to mention a bit about dealing with uh, volume on a budget. Um, we use this uh, thing, this red thing called the Backblaze Disk Firm. Um, it's a very cheap way to get a lot of disk storage. For about ten to fifteen thousand dollars, you can get a hundred and thirty-five terabyte device. Um, and I'm also quite fascinated by these services that allow seeded backups. So CrashPlan and I understand Amazon Glacier, they have this notion where you can send them hard drives and they will load the files from the drives for doing off-site backup. Really critical with newspaper data because it's so big. Right now I have about 40 terabytes of newspaper data and I would not want to have to ship that over a network anywhere. Uh, this kind of service is a fairly cheap way to get a backup done. I don't think Amazon's available in Canada yet, but I'm quite interested in it because this all adds up. So even my little paper, which was a weekly, um, uh, is over 70,000 pages. And if you look at the difference in numbers for format here, we were microfilm until the 80s. From the 80s to the middle of 2006, our back, we have microfiche, and then we have PDS from the middle of 2006 onward. But if you were to scale the numbers, you would see what's very common in dealing with newspapers. The later they are, the bigger they are. So if you have a project that takes in a newspaper that is published, especially since the 60s, those pages are going to add up very quickly. Um, and if you have any kind of project involving a daily newspaper, you are in for a lot of volume because those things are big. I also want to point out, if you'll count the numbers here, you'll notice they go 1921, 1922, 1924, 1925. So our paper had this here practice of loaning out volumes to historians or anyone who was interested. And someone walked off with 1923, and it never came back again. It is literally lost to the world. And that's very common with uh, thanks, uh, community newspapers. Newspapers don't necessarily think of themselves as memory institutions. The other big gutcha is many of them threw away their paper when they did the microfilm. It was largely done to save space. So the microfilm really is, is all you tend to have. This is uh, the number of pages just in our county We've worked on this many titles, and this is not all of them. We have about another 100,000 in progress with two papers the county library is looking at right now. I would guess anyone in this room, if you went and looked at the amount of papers that have been published in your area, you would be astounded by how much is out there. And I would really encourage you to consider digitizing them. So why would you bother? Uh, well, my argument is there's stuff there you wouldn't find anywhere else. My wife and I published a magazine for a while, and I love magazines. It's a really nice canvas to do broader stories than you can do in a newspaper. So one of the stories I did was on the Japanese internment. There was um, second generation Japanese males were sent to Ontario to work on farms. A largely forgotten story in Ontario. But the community newspapers had this story really well documented, and that's why you want to do this kind of work. I interviewed this gentleman, Jan Schutzmanzu. I just wanted to mention him. There's a couple of videos about him on YouTube, but fascinating story, largely forgotten, captured in the newspapers. 
And I've been able to raid them quite a bit for the kind of writing I did for the magazine. So these stories are all in your community as well. I think it's worth pursuing them. But uh, my big argument is I'm not sure who else is going to do it if libraries don't uh, do uh, newspaper digitization. In uh, 2009, there was quite a big scandal that Google bought Paper Record, which many of you may be familiar with, and all the titles sort of went dark for six months. The titles in Paper Record were unavailable to anyone while well, Google was transferring them. And that's just how fragile having the commercial sector take responsibility for this kind of role is. And of course, last May, Google announced it was stopping its digitization program of old newspapers. So even Google isn't necessarily going to do this. So I think the onus sort of falls on us. Um, I just want to thank some places that helped us out with this. Uh, the Internet Archive came up earlier. The Internet Archive was really the first place we worked with for newspaper digitization. They will digitize reels for libraries, and they'll do a very good job of it. Whenever I bring up Rooster Tail, I always bring up a picture of Benjamin Franklin. Because I always think Brewster's the modern Benjamin Franklin, but I'm always freaked out by how much he actually looks like Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> you know? I think they literally could be the same person. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy. Hello? Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> or did you build your own back place, or did you um, have a service provider build one for you? We bought the case from uh, Proto Case in Sydney, Nova Scotia, okay. and then we populated the drives ourselves. But no, we didn't build the case from scratch. I think the case cost about $5,000, and the drives, which are Hitachi three terabyte drives, I th we put it together at the height of the Highland, uh, Thailand drive crisis, and I think right. they were about $200 a drive. And that still cost 15000 It was about 10000 for us when we did wow. it, but we haven't fully populated it. Yeah. Backblaze has three bays that handle 15 drives. We yeah. populated two of them. We haven't done the third one yet, because we were hoping the drives would come down in price. Right. And, and I think they have. I think they're more like 150 right now. Yeah, I think so. I'm just curious to know if that was a, did that go smoothly? Uh, I mean, how difficult was it to build your own backblaze? Well, the thing is with the backblaze, why I like bringing up backup, is we didn't realize that if the power goes out, it can be catastrophic with backblaze. Okay. So the first time the power went out, we actually lost everything. And we now have a system in place to shut it down properly. So UPS. it's a great way of getting space, but you absolutely have to back it up somewhere if you're okay. going to use it. And but other than that, up? we've been very happy with it. Do you back it up onto tape or a parallel backblaze? Uh, well, right now we back it up to other drives and we're planning to ship those to an off-site facility. Right. Um, we'd like to do something more robust, but you know everything that's been done here has been done on an extremely small budget. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for this talk, Art. Uh, just, I can't help thinking about like little optimizations, although you've probably been back and forth through all of this. Using the lab seems like a great idea. I wonder if there's a lot of overhead in virtualizing, or whether you thought about doing like just a direct network boot to an alternate Linux image to be more at the meta level. Yeah, I mean, that would probably be more efficient. Maybe I don't more really work, know, though. though. I mean, the OCR process is so intense. I just, I don't know how much it would actually buy you. you got a couple percentage, maybe, I guess. Yeah. yeah maybe so. Right. And, and the problem with this kind of volume is, once you start something, it's very tricky to stop and change gears and try right, to do it differently, because right. you don't want to fall behind on it. And also, are there, I seem to remember there were EC2 images available that have GPUs, but maybe that's all virtual anyway. I, yeah, I might that be would be worth up. pursuing okay. as well. Yeah, because the graphic support's really critical, and yeah, I don't really know. Like, I didn't try anything but the Amazon standard images either. Like, I know you can upload your own. I didn't pursue that. Oh. 
Just a quick little question. Um, have you heard of a product called Free Dance? Free Dance? Free Dance, yeah. Oh, no. It's, uh, it's a, uh, um, it's like Backblaze. It's, okay. it's, it's a complete redundant um, hard drive storage capacity thing, open source, built on FreeBSD. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's nice disk space is getting a lot cheaper. One thing that kills us right now is we have lots of data on lots of drives, and to put lots of stuff in other places, I mean, it's, it feels like we spend all of our time copying files. I mean, that's the problem with having that much data, so putting it in one place is very attractive. <clears throat> Hello. Um, have you heard of a product called Acropus? Yes. Yes, I wanted to mention Octopus. I have not kept as, tr as, uh, as up to date on it, but it tackles the sort of page pre processing problem in a big way as well. Yeah, it does like a document analysis so you can get the character level coordinates sure. um, and it uses Tesseract as its OCR engine. Yeah, it sort of had this funny, I, you probably know the project quite well, but you know it had that sort of funny, it, it's trying very hard to be completely Python for everything, and I think it is now. Yeah, that's its well, latest incarnation is a Python library. Yeah, it's very effective for book pages in my experience. The problem is the newspaper pages is, I mean, newspaper pages are really quirky to right. handle. I mean, I think Olina right now does a better job off the Emmy channeling for newspaper content, mm -hmm. but uh, OCR, Oc Sorry, how do you say it? Um, I think it's Acropus. Yeah, I never know how to say it. Um, you know, I think they're definitely on the right path. And what's neat about that project is things like the HTML format that Tesseract uses. That came from that project. So, I mean, they have lots of really good ideas on right. how to do this kind of stuff. Um, you also mentioned earlier that you, you weren't aware of what Google's role was in Tesseract. Um, right. And I was at a conference a couple of years ago where I sat next to a guy who worked for Google, and he sat next to the Tesseract developer, so he works for Google. Okay. I, I don't know what they, if they use it or not, but the guy who does the development works there. Yeah, it's hard with Google to actually know who does what or to get an answer on. <laughs> I don't think they have a phone doing. number. I've been after, you know, when the Newspaper Archive project, the plug was pulled, there was this tantalizing suggestion that they would share the images. And I've been after about a million Ontario newspaper images for three years now. And I sort of think I'll get them eventually, but, you know, there's no precedent for Google, and it's very hard to sort of find someone who can do something in a public way without going through sort of just lots of back and forth with different people. Great. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, really great talk. Um, what's the next step now that you have all the data, and are you going to be presenting it to clients on a web browser, or how's that going to work? Well, we, is we, there any special uh, UI considerations when you're dealing with this much data? Sure. I mean, um, I work with a project called Our Ontario, and we don't have all the newspapers I've worked on there because we haven't figured out all of our space issues yet. But it has sort of a user interface experience. Um, I think Island Dora is doing some really neat stuff with newspaper images right now as well. Key to me is how well you can use coordinates. I mean, I think they're the keys to the kingdom. Some projects do article segmentation. They'll break down a newspaper to the article level. Uh, we're nowhere near that. I actually don't know if our OCR is strong enough for that anyway. But I think if you use coordinates wisely, you don't necessarily need that. As a newspaper guy, I like the idea of reading something in the full page with all the surrounding pieces. So are, if where you have, um, say, a, a library that may have done indexing of newspapers, do you have a way to incorporate that kind of data in with the OCR for the searching? Yeah, I think as long as you use um, uh, uh, reasonable URLs, and that's what we tried to do. We have sort of clean URLs that identify the issue and the page number and the date. You can use that to tie off. We actually put the coordinates in the URLs as well. So if you have a column that goes from here to here and you want to comment on that column, you can use that URL to refer to it. And I think that's key. I mean, a URL is really your contract with the world. And I think you really have to do it wisely and make it as repurposable as possible. 
All right, you mentioned that there are box file editors that, that you want to use to, to do that OCR correction while maintaining the coordinates of the, the characters and the words. Uh, could you expand? Well, there's an Ajax one that would work in a web browser environment. The one I use, I think it's called Mahot, M-A-H-O-T-T. -T. Sorry, I, I never know how to pronounce anything. But uh, uh, Mahot's a Python-based app, and it's the one I like the best. But if you want to do it in an online environment, I think the Ajax one would be the one to look at. I mean, it's tricky because, you know, you're going to slow down the process a bit by going character by character, coordinate by coordinate. But I don't know of any other way of handling that elegantly. What's so neat about the box file is you can, you can feed it back into your OCR process, and the process itself could potentially get better. Do you remember the name of the Ajax one? Uh, I can I'll, dig it up for you, yeah. I will ping you. Thank you. Okay, we're right up to our coffee break, so I have to cut the questions here and just say a big thank you, Dart, for this great presentation. Thanks.